Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce to you um, about um, today's topic, uh, be the orchestrator for banking as a service. Uh, and I will um, present my thoughts on a conceptual solution framework uh, for unbundling and rebundling of financial services APIs. So in the previous session of my colleague, um, he has brought you to uh, a concept um, in business about uh, the bundling and unbundling and then rebundling of financial services as time goes on. The current trend is we see there are more um, mobile apps, more open APIs, and driven by also banking regulations for some new players to participate in financial services. Hello, can you hear? We may be experiencing some uh, technical difficulty on the voice, just a moment. Hello, welcome to the topic and uh, I would present a conceptual solution framework for rebundling and unbundling of financial services APIs. So basically, um, the financial services is going through the evolution uh, in terms of um, different regulatory uh, opening by the HAMA, uh, as well as uh, the change in technology and newer players is trying to provide financial services and therefore in the market, um, products are being unbundled into different segments to address uh, specific customer needs. As the trends goes on, there will also be a rebundling um, uh, trends that is driven by a high uh, acquisition cost because of increased competition of these new players to financial services, as well as a desire for simplification and end-to-end -end best of breed products. And therefore, uh, those financial services will be uh, we bundling together, but at a different uh, type of format. With an enabler for rebundling uh, more open API, we think uh, that might not be necessary, the only factor. We think that uh, when we bundling happens in the market, that is very crucial for competitive differentiation of the uh, banking provider. And the end result that is more important is uh, they need to in improve the customer experience to provide the um, simplification end-to-end -end best of bridge services. And therefore they need to create innovative products with a lightening uh, speed of change. They need to move to a newer infrastructure, be it on a private cloud or a public cloud. And they need to have a frictionless business and to defeat the disruption uh, presented by the uh, virtual banks as well as uh, different fintech players. And they need to run everything distributed. So if we bring you to a journey of unbundling and rebundling architecture in software architecture terms, so we can say right now, the financial services providers are undergoing a transition for unbundling, mostly makes use of uh, an approach called microservices architecture. But this is just the um, a means to unbundle, but it's not the end itself, and we'll bring you through the, to that uh, journey. In terms of the agility, they will increase the agility and be more flexible. But at the same time, 
their operational complexity and cost and challenge. So in the near term, we think a conceptual solution framework should be like this. So there needs to be um, an API uh, management, of course, to bridge between the different consuming parts and as well as the providing parts. So be it external APIs, internal APIs will be managed by this API management layer. And the traditional uh, banking core will be using the internal API to wrap around it or using some adapters. So at the same time, uh, when there are changes in internal uh, application, as well as uh, external partners or channels, it will all done through this layer to mediate the changes. And the vision is when the traditional core undergoing this transition, it becomes a microservices core where the services are break down and unbundled uh, in terms of IT architecture. Then it will be moving to the next stage. But let's um, move to the journey of unbundling first. So mostly when the uh, financial services um, company, they have monolith applications. They may use techniques like um, surface mediation or runtime control to add in a layer that let them to make changes. So even though adding in a layer like this, the channels itself and the monolith are not aware of the changes and therefore not required to changes a lot on their side. But then through this surface mediation layer, it will rouse to from channel to surface mapping and the changes we done at this layer. And there is a facade layer that become an adaptation to the monolith functions so that when changes happen, changes can be made at a facade layer. So at the same time, um, the bank can then introduce a microservices uh, architecture alongside of this traditional stack. When they develop the microservices in terms of uh, different functions, they do it uh, function by functions. They decompose it and move it into a microservices architecture. When the channels um, are ready to use the new microservices, it's simply swing the channel to the new microservices. At the same time, of course, function and data will be migrated uh, before uh, transition into this. Then if the financial services uh, company had a strategy to move on to the cloud, they can establish similar uh, infrastructure or use cloud services on cloud providers platform. And then similarly, they can migrate the microservices to the cloud because the microservices developed on premise is already um, developed in a way that is cloud native. Therefore, moving to the cloud is not uh, such a big deal. But then using a gateway pattern, uh, it can also route the uh, channels uh, interaction to the new uh, API gateway, which happens on the cloud. And then it becomes a cloud enabled call. So whenever there are new channels uh, that bring in, for example, a channel with new version or new channels or new third party apps, then the banks then decide uh, whether to route to the traditional um, stack and then, or to route to the new stack on the cloud or route to the on-premise uh, microservices all depends upon the uh, API gateways routing. So this is a, um, usual approach that people um, people think of to do a unbundling uh, of the IT uh, applications become uh, reusable components. But then this, like what I said, it's not the end itself because in this transitional unbundling, uh, those kind of approach will be oversimplified and there are new concerns that can happen and amplify further by rebundling needs as well as third-party uh, services invocations. 
So what you'll foresee is the number of those uh, microservices will grow uh, at an lightning speed. And there's a need to govern them. And there's a need to orchestrate them. And there's a need to ability to rebundle those kind of services, mix and match, reassemble to meet new requirements and business value creations. So there are concerns like how are these services work with each other? How are they going to find each other? Can they securely connect to each other? Would that be failure? How to do a retry or how to monitor and trace the cause? If we do these things, do we code it in the service? So that, that is uh, quite a concern uh, to the uh, microservices uh, developer as well as the architects. So there's a notion uh, presented in the market called a uh, mesh, okay? So the notion is that if the services have to talk to each other, so if there's nothing to help them, then they need to write code to establish connections to decipher service calls, detect issues it covers, do logging and tracing for observability. So if there is some facility, let's say it's a mesh, that can cause the common concerns uh, to offload to a certain uh, certain layer such that the application developer will just concentrate on writing business logic or just invoking uh, the business logic without worrying about these details that would be a great help so therefore uh, on the market there are uh, surface mesh implementations such as uh, istio on the kubernetes or other surface mesh providers but what they done is basically good uh, but there are gaps in the implementations so what are the gaps so from an application perspective how can i route the services based on consumer context how can i mass sensitive data uh, how do i know who is using my app and how they are doing and based on who is using the apps who are the consumers? Can I personalize app behavior? And how about we using and govern the use of those uh, services? And these are out of the picture of the current service mesh implementations. And do we do it in coding? So what you see is the current service mesh implementation is very technical and it only address uh, the boxes in green as you see in the slides. Uh, those are pretty uh, low-level uh, networking-related uh, aspects like connectivity for tolerance, but it does not address applications, needs, and contacts. So to make it worse, if there are multiple domains of uh, microservices, let's say loans domain, deposit domain, uh, and they have different runtime platforms or different technology stack, and it makes things worse, so then you manage the APIs uh, using API gateway, that is uh, for sure. But then um, how do you manage such kind of uh, interaction between uh, domains interconnected? If you have three or five, what happens uh, if you have more? Then what is caused by the coding approach? It's basically uh, disastrous. And we will have the analogous uh, to this Death Star in Star Wars. And you know what will happen to a Death Star. It got to explode ultimately. So what do we think of uh, from software engineering perspective is how about putting API management, not just um, to the um, API gateway layer to enforce, but can we also introduce a add-on to the API management such that it become a fine-grained uh, governance control plane. And then we can basically inject smaller pieces of enforcement into the microservices architecture. So let's say if Surface Mesh right now can handle those things well by 
a low level networking uh, configuration or coding. Then if we add in something on top uh, called the application surface mesh, uh, in short name, app mesh, that will add more business context to it. So the in the app mesh, uh, it should be able to discover different container platforms and then discover the services and bring it in into the API management to amplify it, make it become an API that can be managed. And then these APIs become um, context aware when we add in the policies from API management. And this policy management can be executed right at the side of each microservices. And then this also enabled different uh, services consumption by means of these policies, as well as a application aware uh, proxy at the side of this micro level monitoring, application level monitoring, as well as a landscape visualization. So this basically it will be without coding. As we said, we want to minimize the coding so that we will be agile enough in the future for any uh, rebundling or orchestration needs. So with it add on this uh, micro gateway and application mesh into the infrastructure of Kubernetes. And it can also work without Kubernetes and of course, it can also work with Kubernetes with Istio, for example. So it becomes a very flexible layer that you can add in into different domains of microservices, be it under different conditions. So this product is called uh, App Mesh. That is an application service mesh, a governance control plane add-on to the API gateway. And it works in conjunction with the web methods micro gateway to do the injection of policies right into the microservices to bring in intelligent context-based routing, user authentication authorization data protections, visibility and monitoring checking, context-aware data transformation for personalization, as well as consumption, governance, we use governance, et cetera. But then, like what I said, um, APIs gateway or governance layer is a thin tier to introduce for mediations and add in those governance control. But there are also situations that uh, the microservices or, or the APIs itself Basically, uh, let's say an example of a fund transfer, fund transfer and atomic microservices underlying. And then it has to string into the sequence in order to provide the right functionalities. So this kind of sequencing is very hard to just do it by coding because there are um, many um, uh, exception handlings, uh, transaction handling you have to deal with. Although there are some frameworks out there or coding that can manage this, but if you look into a more uh, higher scale, when you have these kind of composite microservices, uh, not only you need to compose at the uh, composite layer, but then it also needs to string together with your internal corporate systems that may not yet uh, microservices enabled or your external partners. And then when it works together, it has to execute some kind of process sequence. So if your microservices can fire off events, uh, then of course you can exchange between the microservices and that is the approach that is advocated by uh, different um, vendor and practitioners. But if you look at it at details, uh, still there is a sequential a control element, and, uh, even though given is a parallel action needs to be done, and it can't simply just using a um, proxy that routes through uh, and then do 
uh, simple data transformation to uh, achieve this. So in order to do that, uh, basically what we'll need is to introduce services orchestration uh, at the business process uh, as an event-driven process chain, uh, as well as this layer can also uh, contribute to the composite uh, microservices layer. So the tooling itself uh, should be a low-code uh, integrated approach so that multiple persona of people can work on the integration. So if there is developer experience people, they can work on a more professional developer tools to try and job on those orchestration. If it's more business driven users like citizen developers, they have less IT skills, we still have to let them to do the composition themselves at some point. So uh, targeting different personas, this kind of integration flows can be deployed as microservices uh, by means of uh, a microservices runtime uh, that can run inside different uh, execution uh, platform as the execution plane, like the cloud platforms, like your own data centers. And this must be very flexible that it can move around so that uh, it can execute anywhere. And it must be API enabled as well. It can call other APIs. It can uh, string together different things. So. Um, Upon the above uh, discussion, what we'll see is the future of uh, application development for banking as a service and banking as a platform is basically uh, very dynamic. And it, it has four important vision pillar. First is it needed to be tailored to user roles and contacts. It must be able to enable uh, assembled uh, functions such that different business capability can be combined very quickly, be it from external providers, third parties, fintechs, uh, long tails providers, or internal services, uh, traditional ones, or microservices based services. And it has to be distributed, and this will be evolving all the time uh, to address changing uh, business behavior and preferences. So from Software AG, what we see is a convergence of API management, application level, surface mesh, microservices, as well as orchestration and integration technologies together to bring this vision come to true. And what we see in a lot of customer, we are trying to converge these aspects and in our products as as well as our visions is to provide connected enterprise experience uh, through this integrated pieces, be the innovative platforms so that banks can achieve their banking as a service vision as well as platform banking visions. So I'm very glad to share with you um, this vision as well as uh, to share with you how we approach this at a high level. And of course, there are very details inside these technologies and approaches. And we encourage you to go to our websites and our resources in the sections so that you can learn more about this. Thank you for your time. And I'm glad to talk to you. And I hope to talk to you in person soon. Thank you.